The select lectures in physics are brought to you by Stefan University TV at www.stefan-university.edu. Dr. Mari Gelman, Nobel Prize in Physics, 1969. Complex Adaptive Systems. January 28, 1991, La Valencia Hotel. La Jolla, California, USA. Select Lectures in Physics. Stefan University. Complex Adaptive Systems are Scheme Finding Machine, says Murray Gellman. so many disciplines all at once. Uh, before defining it, let me just imagine that we have a complex adaptive system, something that can learn or adapt or evolve, and say it has a, it's rewarded by a greater probability of survival, reproduction, or rewarded in some other way, for finding in a many-dimensional space of options a minimum or a quantity representing failure or danger. The, uh, Physicists usually look at minima. Biologists would rather look at maximum. So you turn the whole picture upside down and say you're trying to maximize success, uh, survival, uh, and so forth. And you imagine a landscape of uh, many minima or maxima, depending on which way you want to look at it. Uh, for instance, a computer that's programmed to play chess attempts to maximize victories or minimize losses. And biological evolution tends more or less we'll get to the more or less later, it tends to emphasize inclusive fitness uh, wherever that can be effectively defined. That roughly it's the survival to reproduction of the organism or of organisms with a similar gene, relative. The, uh, the scientific enterprise, which we've discussed up to now, tends to maximize agreement with observation, more or less, roughly, and so forth. So the uh, kind of thinking we've been talking about is an example of this process of uh, uh, undergone by a complex system. Let's say we talk about minimum, like a physicist. Then when near a minimum in the many dimensional space of possibilities, the complex adaptive system tends to move toward it. And as we were saying, the region in which this tendency to move toward this particular minimum exists would be called the basin of attraction. As with uh, attractors in nonlinear systems that now, on a larger scale, there may, of course, be a great many such, but lots of deeper ones than the one in which the system happens to find itself. So how does the system then get to explore the others so as to find perhaps a very deep minimum, which is what it's really desired, rather than some miserable shallow minimum in the neighborhood of which you happen to be? The only answer in this approximation is to have some noise. And the noise is exactly what we were talking about in connection with uh, uh, creative ideas noise, perturbations, and so on. Or else situations in which the barriers are lower. That's another possibility. It may be that inattention, sleep, trance, and so on are states in which the barriers are lower. But one still needs a certain amount of noise to be knocked out of one base into another. And those uh, random suggestions, like using the last noun on the front page of today's paper, or having your ideas knocked about in a discussion with a bunch of crazy ideas being offered, all of those offer these uh, noise perturbations. Now, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about complex adaptive systems in general. Usually, uh, they exist in an environment which is, itself uh, may have adaptive features, so that you have really co-adaptation or co-evolution. Uh, but let's suppose that isn't true for simplicity. Let's suppose that the environment is some kind of a time series with relatively constant properties, just to be talking about something simple. Nevertheless, it's one that can be affected by the complex adaptive system. Now, the familiar examples uh, on this Earth of complex adaptive systems all have some connection, however remote, with life. Uh, and complex adaptive systems have a tendency to give rise to others. 
Uh, the most obvious example is that biological evolution can deal with a problem by building into the organism through the genetic apparatus uh, some sort of a behavior pattern, kind of thing we like to call instinctive. A behavior pattern that's relatively automatic and that, that deals with the issue. But another possibility is to develop by genetic means in the organism enough intelligence to handle the problem with intelligence instead of instinct. Uh, these are alternatives. They're part of the same uh, process. And so looking at this sort of development, you can construct a chart something like this. One starts with prebiotic chemical evolution, which was a uh, an adaptive process on the earth that gave rise to uh, life. Then biological evolution is another such example. Biological evolution of individual organisms, and we can also think of the evolution of whole ecological systems. As an offshoot of that, one example is that of mammalian immune systems, which are also a system for learning, evolving, adapting. Only the mutation rate is so many factors of 10 higher in the somatic cells of the immune system that you can get very rapid adaptation so that in a matter of hours or days, the immune system can try to fight uh, invaders of the organism, whereas biological evolution takes hundreds of thousands of years. Of so, another offshoot of biological evolution, as we just said a moment ago, is the development of individual learning and thinking in various degrees of sophistication. Once one has that at the level achieved in uh, the human age, then uh, one can have human cultural evolution, where learned information among individuals is transferred from one individual to another and from one generation to another, largely using language. And in fact, the evolution of the human languages is another example of adaptation of uh, a complex adaptive system. So is the evolution of organizations, of societies, of the global economy. And finally, with the development of computers, one has human beings training computers to become complex adaptive systems by having the computers themselves evolve strategies using random variation and selection according to whether the strategy seems to work better or worse. Uh, John Holland's uh, genetic algorithms, for example, uh, do that precisely. That. Now, if we can develop some sort of a general theory of complex adaptive systems, it would apply also to the complex adaptive systems that no doubt exist in many other parts of the universe and have no direct connection with terrestrial life. Whether we would recognize those systems as living, if we could see them, if our Star Trek ship or whatever were to land there and look at them, we don't know. Some of them might be recognized as living, some of them we perhaps wouldn't think of as living, but they would all satisfy this definition of complex adaptive systems, which we're trying to get at. Uh, take, for instance, the case of a planet where there had been living things and intelligent living things according to our normal terrestrial uh, experience. But they'd all die. And they left behind things like John Holland's uh, computers equipped with genetic algorithms. Uh, so we had complex adaptive systems, but they were obviously not what we would call living material. Nevertheless, they could still function as complex adaptive systems. This is just an exercise to see better the generality of what we're talking about. Now, the most constructive thing is to try to define the complex adaptive system by asking how we distinguish in principle a complex system that we call adaptive from uh, one that isn't. Uh, for instance, in turbulent fluid flow, you have eddies. And everybody knows that the eddies give rise to smaller eddies, and so on and so forth. And that if the eddies are of a particular kind, uh, in a particular pattern of flow, they may not survive, they may not have offspring. Whereas other eddies in that particular flow may be situated so that they do have offspring. Now, do we think of that as an evolutionary process, analogous to biological evolution? Do we think of it as a complex adaptive system? We do not. Why not? The reason, according to the Santa Fe Institute, is that well, you can't say that the adaptive, the non-adaptive system is just obeying the laws of physics and chemistry, whereas something like life is not. We certainly don't believe that. We are not vitalists. We believe that life also is just obeying the laws of physics and chemistry. Yet within the laws of physics and chemistry, it has some special feature. Uh, 
uh, complex adaptive systems in general, whether we would call them living or not, seem to have a special feature that the eddies in turbulent flow do not have, or have only to a very primitive degree. And here is what we think it is. The crucial difference seems to be that the complex adaptive system doesn't just record its experiences, but also compresses the information in those experiences into a very short form. Not perhaps the very short as possible, but a very short form. That makes a schema, a theory, a model. And of course, that's exactly what we do in theoretical physics, where we compress all of the material about electromagnetic phenomena into Maxwell's equation, a little set of a couple of equations. And uh, those equations, together with the particular boundary conditions of some particular problem, then determine the answer. So this phenomenon of compression, of making a schema, a model, a theory, and perhaps the most general word, a schema, uh, is the, we think, the essential feature of a complex adaptive system that distinguishes it from something more ordinary, like, say, curve. This way, you can engage in passive learning, making an image of the environment, learning to predict, which is a model of the time series that the environment represents, and learning how to behave, which is a model of the, how the environment responds to particular uh, actions of the complex adaptive system itself. The schema has to have some degree of stability or robustness. If it's completely evanescent, it's useless. At the same time, it can't be too rigid. It has to be in a set of rival schema uh, with some possibility of moving from one to another so as to allow for evolution, adaptation, or learning. There has to be a universe of schema and some degree of choice among them. There also needs to be a feedback loop. It needn't be a, a very rigid feedback loop, but there has to be some degree of at least statistical feedback that allows improvement in the schema, in this choice process. And the scientific enterprise to which we referred, where we began and where we're ending, is one of the very best examples of the, that we know of, of an adaptive complex system. The schemata are the theory. They are robust. When they have predicted a lot of things well, they are quite stable and they stay in the literature. Uh, but they are still subject to modification. And the accuracy of the prediction uh, affects their viability in a positive way. Not always 100%. Uh, wrong theories can be promoted for a while. Uh, bad, uh, uh, correct theories can be ignored or even thrown out. But gradually the uh, process corrects itself. And the theory that predicts data more accurately will eventually triumph, more or less. So here, here is the general diagram that we can make of a complex adaptive system, ignoring co-adaptation or co-evolution. Namely, there are data, including data about previous behavior and its effects. The data are compressed. This is the crucial step to make a model, a theory, a schema, whatever. The schema summarizes and predicts. And it is one of many which are related to one another by mutation and by competition. In the presence of particular present data, like the boundary conditions in Maxwell's equation, the uh, schema unfolds. The compressed schema unfolds to give actual prediction or behavior at what the biologist would call the phenotypic level, the level of reality rather than the level of schema. That then has consequences at that level of reality, or phenotypic level. And those consequences then exert, at least statistically, some sort of a selective effect back on this process of competition among the schema. Now, you, if you're an evolutionary biologist, you would think that we're describing evolutionary biology. If you're a psychologist, you would think that we're describing thinking, uh, including the getting of creative ideas. We talked about the scientific enterprise. Uh, lots of uh, material on the evolution of culture, the evolution of society can fit in this model, and so forth and so on. So in biological evolution, the genetic makeup of an organism, the schema, fantastically compressed. In the presence of uh, the uh, actual uh, environment in which the germ cells uh, develop to become a full organism, you get the organism. But the organism gets not only the information from the schema, 
the gene, the genotype, it gets a huge amount of information also from the environment, the special circumstances of the unfolding. Just as in Maxwell's equations, you don't get the answer just from the equation, but from the equation plus the boundary. And then the survival of that organism on the phenotypic level and its production of offspring has some feedback to the viability of the genetic pattern and related genetic pattern. Now, we get back to our model with the minima or maxima. That happens when, and it is not always true, but when it's a good approximation to consider that there is a payoff function or fitness at the phenotypic level. This is an approximation. It's true when the, it's an approximation that's good when the adaptation or evolution or learning is efficient. In that case, you can regard the whole system as a scheme for exploring fitness maxima or failure minimum. And in that approximation, then, you have the kind of a picture that we drew with a great many different minima searching and needing noise in order to be, in order to be uh, transported from one basin of attraction to another. In that case, you have this hill climbing on rugged landscapes or basin exploring on rugged landscapes and so forth. But it's only an approximation. It's not true uh, in all cases. But it's closely related to this question of how creative thinkers get shaken loose from flawed assumptions to find better ideas. Thank you. Once you recognize that things are identical, then from the point of 
algorithmic complexity, they do not have it. The length of the message necessary to describe them is one thing, and the description of the number of those things. So it's already enormously compressed. The recognition of identity is a fantastic uh, device. All right. So I think we're in agreement. Fitness is an maybe an elusive concept
and historians of science tend to disbelieve it because they can't find any nearly contemporary evidence that he claimed uh, what he claimed when he was old. But the story is, uh, I don't know about pot, I never heard about the contribution of smoking hemp. The story that he told when he was old was that he had, that he had fallen asleep over the, the problem of the benzene ring, trying to explain it as an aliphatic uh, carbon compound with some sort of a diagram with C's and H's. Uh, and that uh, falling asleep, he thought of the chain of carbons with the hydrogens attached as snakes, as you said. And that after a while, in his dream, while asleep, a snake bit its tail. And he woke up saying, it's a ring, it's a ring. Whether the story that he told himself is true or not. Maybe, in fact, he was smoking pot. You may have better information transmitted by private sources. Thank you. In memory of Murray Gell-Mann by Vladislav Alexander, Sasha, Stefan. In memory of Murray Gell-Mann by Vladislav Alexander, Sasha, Stefan. Murray Gell-Mann, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, was born on September 15, 1929, in Manhattan, New York City. He died on May 24, 2019, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, USA. Murray Gell-Mann's unique personality as a human being, physicist, and scientific leader is very well known and has been richly depicted in many walks of life by many an author. Murray Gell-Mann, a Jewish-born American theoretical physicist, was the winner of the 1969 Nobel Prize in Physics for his contributions and discoveries concerning the classification of elementary particles and their interactions. He was a founding member of the Santa Fe Institute, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Murray Gell-Mann was the author of, among other books, The Celebrated the Quark and the Jaguar. See footnote 1. Victor, Vicky, Frederick Weisskopf of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology was Murray Gell-Mann's doctoral thesis advisor. I knew both men personally. I am thankful to them for their support in the establishment of Stefan University. Both men had a high appreciation of each other. Here is what Murray says about his research in elementary particle theory and Vicky's scientific influence on him. See footnote 2 graduate students in theoretical physics, said Gell-Mann, who plan to study the fundamental laws of nature, are very often impressed with formalism, the formal apparatus of their subject. Learning of the beautiful equations of quantum field theory and of Einstein's general relativistic theory of gravitation, some of them dream of inventing something equally important and mathematically elegant. I suffered at least as much as other students, from an infatuation with beautiful formalism. Working with Vicky Weisskopf was a most effective remedy against the excesses of such an infatuation. He never ceases to harp on the importance of pedestrian work in theoretical physics and on understanding. By means of simple arguments, the physical meaning of a theory and its implications I point out that much of my research in elementary particle theory can be regarded as flowing from a struggle between a natural predilection for formal theory and an awareness of Vicus advice. That situation might be compared to that in the garden of live flowers and through the looking glass where an attempt to walk straight toward a beautiful flower bed was quite futile but striking out in a different direction made it possible to reach the objective. Murray Gell-Mann was my guest in La Jolla, California, during the conference. Achievements in Physics, January 28-29, 1991, which I had organized in collaboration with the UCSD Physics Department. Department Chairman, Roger F. Dashen.
in honor of Keith A. Bruckner, founding member of the Department of Physics at the University of California, San Diego, UCSD. Murray Gell-Mann arrived in La Jolla on Sunday evening, January 27, 1991, and left on Tuesday morning. I met him at the San Diego airport and drove him in my red Porsche from the San Diego airport to La Valencia Hotel in La Jolla. I did not know, said Gell-Mann, jokingly, that a young physicist could afford to drive a Porsche, let alone a red one. We shared a laugh. That was an example of Murray's very well-known razor-sharp sense of humor. As I was driving from the airport to La Jolla, we discussed thermonuclear fusion physics, the nature of time, and linguistics, all of this in a matter of less than half an hour. I mentioned to him my far-fetched hypothesis on ephemerons, the particles of time. See footnote 3. He said that time is a mystery. On our way to La Jolla, I mentioned to him that I had had a pleasant encounter last year with Arkady B. Migdal, a famous Soviet-Russian physicist. Murray Gell-Mann swiftly started to explain to me the roots of the word. Migdal. I was fascinated. During Gell-Mann's stay in La Jolla, he invigorated the conference participants with his intellect. In the presence of Murray Gell-Mann, you felt a high intellectual voltage that empowers your own mind, not just at a moment, but also four days thereupon. He was referred to by his colleagues as the man with five brains. Murray Gell-Mann was also known as a man who had a very low tolerance for stupidity. If you said something stupid, you would not be forgiven easily, probably never. After the La Jolla conference, I kept in touch with Murray. I would call him whenever I thought that if there was a person on earth who could answer my questions, that would be Gell Man. Once I asked him a question regarding Kabbalah. He answered it with ease, but then he said to me, jokingly, I will tell everybody that you are interested in mysticism. I was a student in Caltech, said Roger F. Dashen, in 1991, in the early and middle 1960s, and stayed there on the faculty for a couple of years afterward. I never could understand how Murray came up with all those ideas. We all had ideas, but they were small ideas, the Woodpecker ideas. The Woodpecker idea is Einstein's phrase. See footnote 4. Murray would come up with remarkable ideas every two or three days. Murray Gell-Mann, see footnote 5, said Nikolai Nikolaevich Bogolyubov, in 1978, is closest to Einstein in intellectual capacity. I heard about Gell-Mann a lot in Russia. In 1977 to 1981, as I was working at the Lebedev Institute of Physics, Moscow, in the Plasma Phenomena Theory Department led by Viktor Pavlovich Selin, my doctoral thesis advisor. See footnote star. The physicists in Russia characterize Gell-Mann as the one who can be compared with Einstein. In 1951, Murray Gell-Mann was working as a postdoc in the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. There, he often encountered Albert Einstein, usually in the mornings as they were passing by each other. Apparently, Einstein would greet Gell-Mann in his German-English, Good morning. Gell-Mann would reply in his American-English, Good morning. In an interview, see footnote 6. Gell-Mann explained why he failed to approach Einstein and talk with him. He says that in those days, he didn't like kind of people who would approach great figures, get into a conversation with them, and report the experience to others by saying, for example, I know Einstein. That may have been quite a proper attitude for Gell-Mann, but I personally would not have missed the chance to talk with Einstein for all the golden California. 
Murray Gell-Mann added that today in 2003, he would almost certainly have behaved differently and would have asked the great physicist about his thoughts years ago when he was carrying out the greatest physics research since Newton's day. Murray Gell-Mann's Three Phases in Conceiving Creative Ideas Murray Gell-Mann said that there are three phases in conceiving creative ideas. The first is characterized by hard work, days, and nights, the second by awareness that further conscious thought is useless, and the third by a sudden while cycling, or shaving, or cooking. Aha insight popping up. As to the third phase, Gell-Mann said, this, see footnote 7. A deeper part of the human mind is, presumably, involved in the search how to educate heart. The search for forgiveness, compassion, it's something that truly involves, at least occasionally, the parts of the human mind that are outside of conscious awareness. So, there is possibly the relation between the creative thinking and art, and science, and other fields, on one hand, and the search for compassion, forgiveness, and so on, on the other hand. Compassion, says Weisskopf, without knowledge is ineffective, knowledge without compassion is inhumane, 